Good morning. Welcome to morning devotions. We'll be using morning setting daily prayer, page 295 from the Lutheran service book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <coughs> For our devotion this morning, uh, we'll be using Psalm 55. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stairs of the wicked, where they bring down suffering upon me, and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. Confuse the wicked, O Lord, confound their speech, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I would endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I, am, I once enjoyed in sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the grave, for evil finds lodging among them. But I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them, men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil. Yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our text for meditation is Job chapter 8, uh, the first seven verses. This is at the close of Job's first response to the friends. So Job spoke in chapter 6 and 7, basically reiterating the despair he, he initially outcried with, but also bringing in a speech against the friends, against Eliphaz in particular, who spoke just before, uh, saying that, they have not comforted him at all, even though he is in despair, even though he needs comfort. Then uh, Job ends his speech talking to God and wondering why God has uh, focused himself upon human beings and why he preoccupies himself with them. Uh, so Bildad is now basically responding to Job's broken feelings and also Job's confrontation with the words of Eliphaz. So Bildad is going to hunker down on some of the theology that you'll find within the Friends, and I'll be talking about that after, after we have the reading. So Job chapter 8, the first seven verses. Then Bildad the Shuhite replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, 
he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Now, <clears throat> the usual close of these readings, well, readings with it in Lutheran liturgy, is this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> but we find in Scripture some people getting things wrong, uh, Bildad being one of them. So, uh, the word of the Lord, which you find in Scripture, has some contextual pieces in it where people will be speaking, but they will not get things right. So if you pick certain verses out of context, you could try to build a platform for basically an anti-Christian ideal. Uh, for example, uh, when the Assyrians besieged Jerusalem in, at the close of 1 Kings, sorry, 2 Kings, in 2 Kings, middle of 2 Kings, when the Assyrians besieged Jerusalem, you have an Assyrian commander who's saying that your God won't save you, and uh, your God sent me to destroy you. Uh, so if, if we, instead of having bumper stickers like John 3.16, maybe we just put Second Kings something, uh, chapter and verse, where it says, God won't save you. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's kind of the opposite of what we actually want to promote. Now, the idea is that with, uh, with those types of speeches, as, long, as well as the friends here in the book of Job, they will get things wrong, but it is necessary for them to be in Scripture so that we can understand what's, what they're saying and what we would have to say against them. So Bildad, if you heard it, and it's probably going to be a little subtle, is that he's basically saying that if you are pure and upright... God will absolutely defend you no matter what. But if you are a sinner, God will absolutely destroy you. Sir? Are we going to say that's wrong? No. In general, as a general principle, that is correct. And we find these things like in, in Proverbs. Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is making these statements all over the place. But what Bildad is doing he supplying this general principle and saying this must be true in all cases therefore if anyone sins they will be destroyed and if anyone is pure and upright in their works they will be preserved so a good person will not experience evil and Bildad will make a small concession later on in his speech that some people will, will uh experience a little bit of evil, but God will, will make sure that that evil is, is, is undone, lickety-split, so immediately you're brought back into the fold and, and, and you're made uh, uh, prosperous once again. So, suffering does not linger upon the righteous, nor does uh, well, well-being, prosperity, nor will that dwell on the wicked. So, Bildad is saying, if you are suffering, it's because of your own fault, because you have sinned, and if you are prosperous, that's also your own fault. It's your responsibility to be upright and pure, and then God will bless you, and then you will live an upright life. So we find here in Bildad uh, an exposition of what we call retributive theology. Do good and, good, and God will be good to you. Do bad, and God will be bad to you. And it misses all the subtleties in Scripture, especially when we find righteous people suffering, like Job. And Bildad will make his obvious first error in uh, Job chapter 8, verse 4, where he's telling Job, a grieving father, your children sinned against God, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Let that sink in a little. So, Bildad is telling a grieving father, your children are dead because they deserved it. 
This is not what you should be saying to a grieving parent, especially when that statement is absolutely wrong. We know in Job chapter 1 that Job, acting as head of the household, acting as the father of the household before the time of Moses, he acted as priest, uh, sacrificing on behalf of his children so that they, uh, so that uh, their sins are forgiven in these sacrifices, uh, which is the standard Old Testament practice, is that you offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin, because uh, as it says in the book of Hebrews, there is no salvation without the shedding of blood. So Job's children are, do not stand guilty of sin, because all sins they have committed are forgiven by God. So they died not of their own fault, but because Satan took them away. Okay? And we know in the grander scheme of things that God has saved the, these children of Job by their faith so that they will stand in the resurrection. And Job chapter 42 kind of hints at that. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon that when we eventually get to Job chapter 42. But Bildad is saying, if somebody has died, then they have deserved it. Which, yes and no. Uh, with original sin corrupting the flesh, the flesh must be sown in the ground, must go into death because it is sinful, but that is a consequence of sin, not because uh, you yourself are absolutely unrighteous. If that was the case and everybody has died except for or, uh, Elijah and Enoch, because um, they were taken to heaven before, before they died in the flesh, that all people uh, are guilty of sin and have died and, and therefore not righteous. Even Jesus Christ, because he has died, would then be considered under Bildad's template to be unrighteous because he has died. Whereas, in fact, Jesus was a perfectly righteous man who took on the sins of the world so that and when, when he died, sin died with him. And Bildad is not understanding this. So, in counseling, if you're going and you're basically saying all these things are your fault, all these things are results of your sin, you're not actually helping anyone and you're actually misinterpreting scripture for the purpose of destroying this individual, especially basically taking their spirit and saying, no, you're sinful, stay, you, you must be, <laughs> you're sinful, so you're down, trapped in sin, Therefore, make yourself the best possible you you can and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and make yourself completely righteous and be perfect in your life. Because that is the message Bildad is pointing at. He's saying, if you are pure and upright even now, God will rouse himself on your behalf, restore you to proper place. He's saying, uh, well, he's implying that if you do the best you can be, if you make yourself pure, if you're the most perfect person on earth, then God will bless you. So, there, so and in so doing, Bildad is making God's love dependent upon your action and upon your purity. But if you are a sinful human being, then you're already lost. Bildad himself is a sinful human being, and he is already lost, and he will actually need to be forgiven at the end of the book. That's also Job chapter 42. But right now, he's acting, the, he's uh, declaring himself righteous and, and saying that, that his words are true, even though they are, even though they're grossly misunderstanding the situation. So how should we understand things? Well, we should not be, as Bildad, making a lot of assumptions, a lot of generalizations. Generalizations can be good, given in certain circumstances. Like in the book of Proverbs, you can say, generally, that sinners will go down into death, and the righteous will, be, uh, will live, everlast, live in life everlasting with God. And we can say these things, because they are true. But if we're trying to apply them to very specific cases, like if you have... Uh, undergone some suffering in your life, if you have lost a loved one, we're, it, it doesn't make any sense to say they have died because they were they're sinners, or you have lost them because you are a sinner. 
because we don't actually know that. It could be like in the case of Satan here, where Satan attacked Job because he was righteous. So Job is suffering because of his righteousness, not because of his sin, not because of any sinfulness he has. And when we go with our message to people, we should actually be pointing at figures like Job and someone who far surpasses Job, like Jesus Christ, and saying, in Christ was their suffering. Christ suffered in his flesh, even though he committed absolutely no sin in his entire life. He was perfect and pure. He is God in the flesh. Therefore, he is righteousness itself. But Jesus, a righteous and perfect man, still suffered because the way the world is, the way, uh, the, the sinfulness of the world and Satan who lingers within it, they fell upon Jesus Christ and made him suffer in his flesh, even though Jesus was perfect and upright. And even though that was the case, Jesus, participating in God, was not left to his suffering, but brought out of his suffering into newness of life. And if we are looking to Job in, in these comparisons, Job was brought out of suffering, brought out of uh, his poverty and his sickness. While still alive, he did not yet die. He, lived, he was restored and then he lived uh, an, at least another 70 years, maybe 140, depending on how you read the verse. But he lived after he was restored. But if we're looking at the case of Jesus Christ, first Jesus died, and then he was restored in the flesh, brought out of the grave and brought into newness of life, where he has a perfect body, and we will have a perfect body like his when we are resurrected. So for Bildad, he's misunderstanding the situation in, base, in, uh, uh, in trying to pin why certain things are happening, but... The truth is, he doesn't actually know why things are happening, and neither do we all the time. Rather than looking at that, what we should be in trying to figure out the mind of God and trying to get information we can't possibly obtain, we should be looking at Scripture, at the Christ-like figures of Scripture, like Job, and most definitely, and first and foremost, we should be looking at Christ himself and seeing who Christ is and what he promises us, which is not that we will be prosperous in the flesh all the time, and that we will actually undergo suffering as Christians, being targeted because of our righteousness under God, because we are forgiven in God, made righteous by, his, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and therefore attract those who want to attack God. So we will be attracting the attention of Satan in the flesh, and we will undergo suffering. But even though we undergo suffering, we can still be brought out of it, Actually, we will be brought out, not, not just we can be, but we will be brought out of suffering. And this is either going to be in this life, like in the case of Job, or in the life after the resurrection, in the case of Jesus Christ. So even though some people have gone into death as Christians, uh, suffering until they leave us, they will be brought back as Christ was brought back, as Christ was raised, in a perfect body in which they will suffer no more. And this is the hope that we can point to as Christians, not, not the hope of uh, that Bildad's trying to promote, trying to be as righteous as you perfectly can, and, and then just hope that God will bless you. But the hope of Jesus Christ that God assuredly will bless us in our life, not because of anything we have done, but because he is faithful to us. Amen. We continue with the service with the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on the back cover of the hymn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He sent into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, we know that in this life we are sinners, but we also know that in you we have the forgiveness of sins by the blood shed upon the cross. Please, Lord, forgive us by your blood and reconcile us to the Father, that we may be perfect and upright in his sight, not having our sins counted against us, but being perfectly righteous to him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, when we are suffering in the flesh, help us not to try to work harder or, or do more to try and earn salvation. But, Lord, always point us to Jesus Christ, point us to his suffering and death, and also to his resurrection, that we might have hope that even those made righteous by Christ will suffer in this life, but will be raised from suffering into newness of life, into purity and perfection, if not in this life, then in the life to come. Please, Lord, stay with us and encourage us through our Lord Christ Jesus. In your mercy we pray. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create the beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our lives sanctified, and our work this day be well pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.